Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild. I'm a powerlifter, sometimes Highland Games athlete. And I'm currently very, very bloated getting ready for this meet in a few weeks. Oh. <laughs> uh, <sighs> nice. Uh, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson, owner of Extreme Human Performance, faculty member at the Keurig Institute, teach online, and I got to see Michael Graves from the Misfits perform last night and meet him, so that was pretty cool. You are an avid uh, conference goer, my man. Yeah, it was super fun. I saw him last time I saw him perform. I interviewed Jerry Only, one of the founders of the band, and that was 20 years ago at First Avenue, so it was, yeah, it was pretty cool to see him again just doing some solo stuff and some Misfits songs. Right on. All right, folks, today we have um, some listener questions that lead to some science. I don't know, at least from my perspective, I wouldn't call it breaking science news, but uh, some recent papers to help address their questions. Uh, And then in the topic of the day, we're going to talk about dumbbells. So um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everything dumbbells, we haven't really touched on that as much. So if you've been curious about how dumbbells are used across different strength sports or for different... Uh, purposes, this show is for you. But let's get started here. Our first mail, let's see. Strength and Muscle Sport News. This is from Nathan. He says, uh, hey, long-time listener, first-time donor, I love you guys uh, and what you put out there for us. It's greatly appreciated. I wasn't able to find anyone Uh, to contact, let's see, within the site other than this. So hopefully this can be directed in the right direction. Here's the bottom line. I am curious if you guys have talked about keto-style dieting for TBI, so for traumatic brain injuries. Uh, My brother suffered many concussions in his younger teens, uh, and he seems to be feeling the repercussions of those incidents now in his early 30s. I've done some reading on the topic, and I've heard some feedback for those... um, who have made the switch. Any input or feedback would be greatly appreciated, even if you could just point me in the direction of some studies. Thank you so much for your time, and keep up the great work. Um, I will offer one thing quickly. I actually pulled a paper for you here. This is from the Journal of Lipid Research. Now, it's 2014. It's not spanking new stuff. Uh, By Prins, P-R-I-N-S, and Matsumoto. Uh, and here's here's the bottom line. By the way, you could get this article for free uh, if you go to PubMed. If you go to Medline, it's one of those free articles, so you can actually read the entire piece if you would like. But it says, the post-injury period of glucose metabolic depression is accompanied by adenosine triphosphate decreases, so energy loss, right? Free radical production, DNA damage, and inhibition of glycolytic enzyme pathways. In other words, your brain normally runs on glucose. Now it's not running on it so well. So under these post-brain injury conditions, impaired glycolytic metabolism, um, glucose becomes less favorable as an energy substrate. So ketone bodies are the only known natural or alternative substrate for glucose for cerebral energy metabolism. And they point out that there are some other fuels that could be used by the brain, but ketones are the only fuel that can contribute significantly. So I think the idea here is during uh, at least the period afterward, and I don't, they don't have a time frame on here, but if your brain usually runs on glucose and it's not doing that so well, ketones could provide the fuel to help it heal. So the idea here says preclinical trials that involve post-injury implementation of ketogenic diets have demonstrated improved structural and functional outcomes uh, in TBI models and in concussion models, and even spinal cord injury. But then they go on to say further studies are necessary. So again, that's Prins and Matsumoto. So <clears throat> some peer-reviewed science does suggest 
that ketogenic <clears throat> diets may help. Again, providing a fuel <clears throat> when glucose isn't really working very efficiently uh, for your brain. So uh, again, free article is available online. Dr. Nelson, do you know anything about this? Yeah, I'm in the process of possibly doing a one day course for the Kerrig Institute for Functional Neurology on nutrition and different brain issues such as TBI and possibly Parkinson's, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And there's some pretty good data on the ketogenic diet for it. I mean, again, some of it's still considered, I guess you could say preliminary. Um, a couple of good resources if people want to go super far down the rabbit hole. Uh, one of them is called Nutrition and Traumatic Brain Injury, Improving Acute and Subacute Health Outcomes in Military Personnel. So if they just put that in quotes into the old PubMed, it'll show up and that one's uh, open access. Um, another one that's super cool, I think I may have um, got this from Dom D'Agostino initially, put it on Facebook, uh, called Metabolic Control of Brain Homeostasis. And that's in the journal uh, Frontier. And they did a whole kind of almost mini review of just all different topics kind of related to brain health. And you can get them all as a PDF download, and they're all open access too, which is pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> most of the data I've seen is similar to what you said, Lonnie, that when you get kind of whacked in the head, the glucose metabolism gets all screwed up. And so your <clears throat> brain is looking for an alternative fuel source to possibly run better on. Uh, ketones appear to provide that in terms of exactly what ketone body it is. Uh, it's probably a little bit debatable. Uh, some, some buddies I've talked to in research that there's some theories that you probably have to be on a ketogenic type diet before you get whacked in the head to see the, the most benefit. Oh, um, but after appears to be beneficial, um, as people know, you can get uh, a ketogenic salt right now as a supplement. So they take currently the BHB, so beta-hydroxybutyrate molecule, which is one of the ketone bodies that's produced when you're on a ketogenic diet or in ketosis, and they attach it to a salt. And you can take that as a supplement within 20 to 40 minutes. You'll see blood levels of BHB, which is what you measure on that little blood indicator when you poke your finger and you've got the ketone stick in there. Um, that's actually what it's looking at. So it's interesting now with the supplement, you can actually increase uh, BHB levels within a matter of minutes. So I find that kind of fascinating, especially for uh, brain trauma and different things like that, that in the past you'd say, oh, well, you have to start a ketogenic diet right away, but it may be several days before you even, you know, get ketone levels high enough. Right. Yeah. Um, Beyond that, there's uh, medical grade ones that are attached to an ester, which can get ketone levels really high. Right now, they're not approved as a supplement. They taste like friggin' jet fuel and pretty horrible. Um, but I know um, George Brooks's lab, last I heard, was doing lactate infusion in some uh, neuro patients. Mm -hmm. So for listeners, he's the godfather, I would say, of lactate metabolism. Yeah, agreed. And the thought. Yeah, I thought being there, same idea, right? So can we give the brain another fuel source to use, you know, while it's trying to fix its sort of broken glucose metabolism? So all that to say that I, it looks like it's pretty good so far from what I've seen. Um, a couple of years ago, I put up a post wondering about in the future in contact sports such as football, would you have like two containers on the sideline? You know, one's the standard glucose for people who are not injured and someone gets kind of whacked on the head or maybe before they go out and play or something like that, maybe you've got the more ketone supplement one to try to hopefully help with brain health. But yeah, probably a, a ways out on that. That sounds like, you know, we have so many ideas we toss out on the show that could be commercialized. Yeah. We should just go to Gatorade and say, hey, how about a Gatorade that's spiked yeah. with beta-hydroxybutyrate? You know? Yeah, I mean, it's not that crazy of an idea. Um, I actually tried to get a couple of people to do it about two years ago, and eh, no one really jumped on board per se, although I'm sure somebody is doing it somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, the catch was, as far as we could tell with the research, that uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate may not be the main one to help protect from the acute um, issues when you get whacked in the head. Mm -hmm. eh, no, some of that data hasn't even been published yet. So, and then as you guys know, the hard part is that 
randomized controlled trials on that are in, almost impossible. Yeah, you right? can't There's whack some good people. studies on creatine. They hyperloaded rats on creatine and thwacked them on the head. Yep. Um, and they showed that creatine in high doses definitely helped. But no IRB is going to approve a study where you give a bunch of people creatine, half not, and then you thwack both of them on the head. So Right. Yeah. Line up over here, you guys. I got a baseball yeah. bat. Put on a football helmet, <laughs> you know, and we're going to whack you a good one. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I've been looking for it. I haven't found it yet. I would imagine it's out there. But looking at people who say have played you know, football for maybe 10 years, self-report, people who've taken creatine monohydrate and those who haven't, you know, maybe you could kind of follow them and see if there's any sort of protection effect over the, the course of time. You know, Maybe the effect size isn't, isn't big enough, but that may be one way to kind of try to tease it out a little bit. Right on. Just a little context for everyone, if you're not familiar, normally, of course, you have to go on very low carbohydrate diets for days, like Dr. Nelson said, like yeah. literally like 50 grams a day. What happens in those situations, sort of semi-starvation states, at least starved of carbohydrates, is you mobilize so many fatty acids from your love handles, right, that you can't burn them completely. So ketone bodies are sort of partly broken down fatty acids. There's three of them, and when Dr. Nelson said they taste like jet fuel, one of the three is actually acetone. And if that sounds familiar yeah. to you, that's paint thinner, right? That's nail polish remover. So yep. it, it blows my mind that the body makes some of these kinds of things. But yeah, acetone, well, acetoacetate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, but I think the, the most important thing maybe for our listener here is what Dr. Nelson said, that you don't have to wait days and go on a really low-carbohydrate diet uh, you even have to be on a fairly low protein diet, and we, we won't go there, but some guys eat too much protein to get into ketosis as well. But the point being is, yeah, you could almost immediately get your ketone levels up uh, without the, the dietary metabolic type approach because of these new supplements. And I, I just think that's uncharted territory, right? The human body isn't used to seeing high levels of ketones in a well-fed, well-carbohydrate-fed state. So it's it just it's opening new doors, I think. So. Yeah, and that's the discussion I had a couple of years ago on a panel at ISSN with uh, Dom D'Agostino and Lane Norton and some other guys that we've never been able before, unless you look at ketoacidosis, which is everything kind of gone awry and people who are not metabolically healthy. Extreme. You yeah. haven't been able to get insulin levels super high and ketone levels super high at the same time. Um, but now you can. Um, so Cox did a, a paper showing where they uh, basically gave athletes uh, carbohydrates. They had them replete. And then they gave them, I think it was a diester ketone. And did show, I think it was like a 2% increase in performance. I'd have to double check on that. Mm -hmm. But pretty high level athletes. So 2% increase is pretty massive. Um, but there's another paper recently where they just gave people super high levels of ketones. But then had them do very high intense exercise. And it seemed to impair high intensity exercise, you know, which would kind of make sense. So I think we're at just the threshold of trying to figure out, you know, what is best? Is there a performance enhancement benefit? What type of event? Um, yeah, I just get a little worried about people adding ketones to their diet and then still eating a super high carbohydrate diet. There's no data to show that those levels end up being bad, but and that just that condition just doesn't really show up at almost any other time. No, and when right. it does, they're both super elevated and it's not good. Yeah, it's well, it's to me, it seems like it's just something that doesn't exist in nature. Right. How does your body exactly. deal with that metabolically? So, yeah. yeah so I say open doors, but you, there, there'd be a cautionary tale there as well, because we don't know what's going to happen in that kind of situation. I don't want people to think that they're acutely toxic necessarily, no. I mean, you know, but in, in any case. So the big takeaway from that is that if they do decide to use that, like for people I use them with, and I've tested just about everyone on the market, I have them do it primarily under a fasted condition, because yeah. that's going to more mirror what a ketogenic diet is going to look like. Right, what the body expects, yeah. Yep. Phil, have you worked with concussion? I know you have a lot of like young people there and football players and stuff. Have you seen much concussion? No, not a lot. Um I mean, yeah, I think you have it, but I mean, not not a ton. I had a kid that had to take a couple weeks off because of a concussion in football. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I haven't had to like, you know, that's the only one I've had to, in recent years. I've had to deal around, and he was his job, doctor just had him take a couple weeks off. Um, but I'm sure I have some that just have had. I, I have numerous football players and things 
and wrestlers. So I'm sure we we've had some, but I haven't had to. We haven't had to like change training for it. Right. So, yeah. Uh, there's aside a, from that, it just some time off. You know. No, exactly. Yeah. There, there's actually a, a very senior level. He's a really great guy, Joe Congeni, Doctor Congeni here in uh, Akron, Ohio, and that's his specialty, is concussions. So it, maybe we can even get him on the show. He'd be actually a really nice guy for a senior level guy. He's so unassuming, you know. He's so bright, um, really a good person. So maybe we can get him on too and see what he has to say about some of this stuff. I mean, in the st pure strength sports, you're not going to see a ton of concussions. But like you're talking about when you football. It makes me think what Mike you always say, which is, you know, parents will fuss and fret yeah. over, oh, I don't want my son on creatine, and yet they'll push him out onto a football field to get their bell rung, you know, ten times yeah. a season. So yeah, that boggles the mind. It does. <laughs> yes, it does. <clears throat> okay, uh, this might roll into our next question because it's also about the nervous system and healing. So. Um, let me preface this by saying I, re I reached out to two friends of mine who are physical therapists that specialize in neurological rehab, and, and uh, I'm waiting to hear back from them. Um, until then, though, we're going to offer you a little bit of science. So this is from Aaron. He says, hey, guys, I got turned on to your show by a friend at the gym. Love the variety and the theory and experience that you can throw into just about every facet of strength training, fitness, etc. I was hoping one of you gentlemen had any knowledge of uh, CNS repair uh, regarding stimulating nerve growth and stem cells, stem cell activation. Um, he says if that's the correct wording. I have a brachial plexus injury, and then in parentheses, herbs palsy uh, of a minor sort, and it is a limiting factor. That being said, if you're familiar with this birth defect or injury, do you know any coaches that might have some experience with it? I like powerlifting, I love Olympic lifting. But I can't snatch or clean, uh, I'm sorry, I can't snatch or jerk due to limited range of motion. In spite of all this, I do have some decent numbers despite my defect. So here he says snatch is 95, clean 295, squat 405, bench 265, and deadlift 455 pounds. He is six foot three. he weighs two and a quarter. So he's a big boy, he's got some good powerlifting numbers. But his Olympic lifting numbers obviously are are suffering. Uh, now the well, reason, the yeah, the reason I said this, the prior one might help with this is who knows if you supply uh, alt alternate fuels or something. You know, you're trying to get some fuels, I think, to some of these um, neural tissues. I guess it's hard to say what some of that would happen. But I did find a piece on um, stem cells. Let me read this because this is just sort of a Again, this is another 2014 paper, so I can't call it news, but it, it's very relevant. It's from the Biomed Journal uh, by Thakkar and colleagues, T-H-A-K-K-A-R. Co-infusion of autologous adipose tissue-derived neuronal differentiated mesenchymal stem cells. All right, let's stop right there. <laughs> so <laughs> this just means they're taking fat from the same person and using it as a source of stem cells. Um, a viable therapy for post-traumatic brachial plexus injury, a case report. So this is not exactly the same, but I, I honed in on the whole brachial plexus idea. It says stem cell therapy is emerging as a viable approach in regenerative medicine. Here, a 31-year-old male with brachial plexus injury had complete sensory and motor loss since 16 years uh, with right pseudomeningocele at the C5 to D1 levels, uh, et cetera, so they, they describe the injury. Basically, they describe as irreversible damage. We generated adipose tissue-derived stem cells and bone marrow-derived stem cells. Uh, they injected them under local anesthesia. Bottom line, no untoward effects were noted. He has sustained recovery with re over a follow-up period of four years documented with electromyography nerve conduction velocity studies hmm. so um a, a great result for the use of stem cells in this particular type of brachial plexus injury so um i don't know that may provide you some hope i don't know how this relates to your specific condition though uh so uh and, and mike uh, you know a bit about stem cells 
Yeah, I mean, my thoughts on that is that there's a little bit older paper, actually, it's 2011 called Enhancing Central Nervous System Repair, The Challenges. Um, kind of talks about something similar, and there's probably more up-to-dated stuff on that now. Um, yeah, I don't know anyone who's doing it directly, but obviously there's a ton of research going on in that area, and that was a pretty cool case report you had there. So, um, yeah, I mean, most of the stuff that I'm aware of is older stuff looking actually at cardiac tissue. Um, and that was kind of interesting, too, that this may be going on the nervous system, I'm not sure, that the original cardiac stem cell stuff they did, they would say, oh, you've got this big patch of a bugger of a scar tissue on the heart. So we're going to go in, we're going to flood it with all these stem cells, we're going to try to get that area to regrow. And in the initial um, ones they did, which were not blinded studies, patients all reported better, their EF, so a marker of how well the heart is doing, injection fraction was better. When they did follow-up studies, they tagged these cells with um, a way that they could image them. So they wanted to see how many were there and what they were doing. And what they found was almost none of them were on the scar tissue. They're oh. like, well, what the hell? These people were getting better, but you know, none of them stayed where we thought they were. So one of the theories there, at least for cardiac stuff, is that maybe they're doing something and secreting localized growth factors and things of that nature that, that's causing um, repair and other changes, but maybe it's not doing exactly what we thought. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a fascinating area. I'm not too up to date on the, the nervous system in terms of uh, neuronal repair, though. Yeah, I do. I If you listen to Science Friday, by the way, you can pick up a lot of this cool stuff. I remember them talking about that heart study. One of the things th they're concerned about, at least early stage, was the medium that the stem, stem cells you put them in, Correct. they could revert. Like some, They were using some skin-derived ones in one cardiac study, yeah. and they started reverting, I think, to skin cells on your heart. Okay, that's not good. Your heart's a muscle, you know, and things yeah, like that. They, they find that a lot of the local stress is what matters a lot. So when I was doing some graduate work in uh, biomedical, one of the projects I almost worked on was actually an artificial vessel. So what they had the best success doing is trying to recreate all the conditions and stressors and nutrients that they're exposed to. And seed the cells in this scaffolding and then basically have this fancy machine that's stressing them like a vessel and then allow the cells to to do what they're supposed to do but exactly what you were saying if they get that kind of environment wrong then the cells start signaling something else that wasn't what they wanted so i asked a friend of mine keith who's a biochemist where are we with this where are we with this progress i've heard some you know frightening things on science friday and you know i'm not um i'm not a stem cell researcher and he said there there have been real advances even since then, mm. right? Uh, but, I, I mean, obviously they don't have this completely down to a T. But uh, I remember another study they were talking about. I'm almost sure it was on Science Friday where they took rodents. I think I actually pulled this paper and mentioned it on Iron Radio long ago. But complete spinal cord, you know, um, severance. They severed it. And then they injected stem cells in some of the rats, but not the others, and they tried to rehab them. Um, and interestingly, some of them, they used food as a driver. So they needed motivation, mm. like that descending corticospinal tracts. They wanted to stimulate it. So they got the rats to really aggressively go for the food and try to walk. And they had really good recovery. And the rats that didn't have that motivation, the stem cells by themselves didn't take nearly as well. Ah, no uh, signal. <laughs> yeah, right? Makes sense. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, so that's neat stuff. And I want to ask Phil something about this, too, about the dark ages. <laughs> because, <laughs> because stem cells are changing medicine for sure. And I'm sure, Phil, when you were, when you were little and you got run over, there mm -hmm. was nerve damage. And you probably dealt with some of the same frustrations as the listener with, like, you know, some lifts naturally better than others. Oh, yeah. You know, but but the injury seriously limited you in other ways. Uh, psychologically, how did you deal with that? Like, what was your approach to all that? Jeez. Um, yeah, that's, that's a hard question. Yeah, that is a hard question, especially since I was so young um, when it initially happened. Um, I think the biggest thing I was is that I did was <clears throat> I just had this mindset of, like, well, gained a mindset, I guess, of, 
you know, I saw, it might have helped that I was younger. I saw my friends riding bikes and running and jumping and this and that, and I just wanted to be part of that. So <laughs> I would do whatever it took to do that. Um, so I guess it's just being headstrong was a lot of it. And I think that's what limits a lot of people is they just, they, they limit themselves. The doctor says you can't do this. So they're just like, okay, you know, and they sit in a wheelchair forever or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they literally take uh, today's current science as like the described in stone. Um, like I was told I'd never walk and things like that. And I was like, well, no, I'm going to walk. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And I just did what it took. You know, and, you know, the minute they told me that I, they, they gave me the okay to be on crutches, I was already on crutches. Once they gave me the okay to go down to one crutch, I lost them both and things like that. And <laughs> I'm not saying, uh, I'm not a doctor, so don't use that as advice. It worked for me. <laughs> right, yeah, That's yeah. That's the thing. I, I always pushed rehab to that next level uh, type of thing. I've done that since then. Yeah, you have. For me, <laughs> you know, so... Um, I was just always very aggressive with the rehab is, is kind of what, uh, and the, the funny thing is now I talk to PTs that I know now and that's where PT is heading. Um, yes, compared it is. to where it was 20 years mm-hmm. ago. Yeah. More aggressive. Slow. And now it's like, okay, we're going to get you up and walking today. You just had surgery. Yep. Five ago. So, right. um, mm-hmm. I, I guess I was accidentally on the, uh, cutting edge, I think is probably what helped. Um, but other than that, I mean, some of it was just dealing with it. There's there's parts of my leg I just, I still don't feel. Oh, you wow. know, it's just not there. Um, and I think there's there's definitely limiting factors in the neural connection of the muscles in that leg and blood flow. Like the blood flow is greatly reduced because they removed, uh, I think it was two of my veins to repair the femoral artery. Mm. So. The other veins in that leg, the veins in my left leg versus the veins in my right leg, the veins in my left leg are like massively oversized because they're, yep, they're more flow that are removed. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's neural damage, there's, there's vascular damage, blood flow. Um, so I did extra work for that side uh, and tried to make it work better. And, you know, speed work for just that leg, things like that. Um. And still to this day, I, I think what, what limits that side the most is eccentric strength for some reason, not concentric strength. Hmm. Like lowering myself from a big step, uh, I'll make it about halfway down and it just wants to plop from that point. Um, but on the other side, it doesn't do that. You know, I can easily lower myself. Uh, and that's, I can control it if I think about it a lot. <laughs> so, that, that's interesting, actually. And that's, it, that's what makes me think that's kind of more of, more of a neural connection thing. The strength is there, mm-hmm. but I have to really concentrate to lower myself slowly with that leg instead of just, boom, you know, fall onto the... Hmm. Right. Um, you know, that makes me think of the, the paper I was reading. I, I mentioned it on the show, I think, last year. Uh, they were given, they were coaching guys to think about their triceps or their pec in, in a bench press, and you could actually, with EMG, say, yeah, look, he's firing more triceps when I tell him to focus on his triceps. You know, and it's kind of what you're saying with your leg. If you really focus on it, maybe you can increase the activation very specifically. You know, it's yeah, and even to this day, in like my squat warm ups and things like that, on my early sets, I will think about using that side because I have days where it'll just be like, oh, this is all one sided, <laughs> and I can feel it that I'm mm-hmm. I'm doing most of the work with the the side that was uh, not injured. Right. So imagine, Phil, like if you were to if you would have gotten some stem cell therapy or something in the process imagine it's like that rat study right you have to have that drive that motivation to kind of stimulate it um but the combination of this with stem cell man you could have been back twice as fast and with none of what none of what you deal with now or at least less you know potentially sure yeah i mean modern medicine is pretty amazing i mean so yeah it's sweet it's neat seeing yeah part of that when you were a kid phil is that you just didn't really know any different like, yeah, like you so. said you're like hey all those kids are doing it well i'll just figure out a way to do that right <laughs> a lot of, uh, yeah i do i mean i think that's like okay i'm a kid i'm supposed to do that too yeah. so um yeah i just didn't know better yeah so i just did it you know yeah. so okay yeah well, maybe, <laughs> that, maybe that provides a little bit of hope you know uh, yeah. for, for our listener and for other people in similar situations but a little bit of science a little bit of uh 
psych there, you know, practical application. Good stuff. All right. That's going to be it for the mail that became science news of a sort. Uh, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about dumbbells. Hey, listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit royalty on the book. But that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. I can't stop feeling. Some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this Hi listeners, this is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rated in your thoughts. Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio type format, the show is listener supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or... Click the donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org, and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're back, uh, and we're going to sort of enter the weight room and talk about dumbbells here. Before we do, let me offer a few things. We're in the middle of the fall funds drive. I want to offer some thanks to some new supporters. Uh, I might have mentioned one or two of you last week, so I'll just do it again. 
uh, Nathan, Stuart, Eli, and Matt. Thanks, guys. You help keep the lights on. It's it's real, right? We're listener supported. So uh, thank you a lot. And one of the things that I know Phil and Rob and I have thought about since the very beginning, and I know that uh, Dr. Nelson supports this too, but recognizing existing supporters, right? It's, I, I don't like all this stuff like you'll see, oh, this deal is only for new subscribers. What about your yeah. loyal people, you know? F you, you know, like cable companies or whatever, bankers. I hate bankers. Anyway, <laughs> so thank you. This is random, but random list from recent uh, supporting members, uh, Prasan, Holly, Brittany, and Bradley. Thank you, right? Seriously, 50 times thank you for supporting Iron Radio. All this kind of stuff we did, like just go find some studies and then offer it perspe different perspectives it's for informational purposes, but it matters. So at least we think it does. So thank you. Okay, having said that, uh, dumbbells. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, I have a certain mental image when I think of dumbbells about what Phil might or might not do or some of the highly creative uh, things that <laughs> Dr. Nelson might do. <laughs> and that's partly because of our interactions over the years. But uh, Phil, let's ask you, um, well, I guess first, do you use them yourself or at Strength Guild very much? Yeah, we'll use them some. Um, like early on in a training cycle, more for when we're doing rep work, when we're, we're away from a meet, doing hypertrophy work, things like that. And then I'll also use them for unilateral you know, loading type things. Oh, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of pressing overhead because we always view that for most of my athletes who aren't Olympic weightlifters, at least. Um, pressing overhead is more of an assistance type move. So it'll be, uh, you know, dumbbell press overhead instead of a, a barbell. And I usually have them do that one at a time. So you'll do right arm, left arm type of thing. Because then we get additional bang for the buck. I mean, I make them do all that stuff. I don't believe in overhead press like seated, usually unless there's some kind of weird injury. Yeah. Um, okay. Like I have a lady that has a brain injury. So, okay, sit down. You know? Right, yeah. But uh, uh, then you get that, you know, kind of cross-sectional loading of the trunk and things like that. So, yeah, um, okay. yeah I mean, we'll use it for that and. Loaded carries, suitcase carries, things like that. I guess you could put that. A lot of times we'll use a farmer's walk, but it's still it's a, a akin to the dumbbell. Right. Yeah. But or so yeah, we'll use them for that type of stuff. I don't do a lot of uh, I guess the occasional goblet squats with new people and things like that. But I mean, I we don't do a lot of dumbbell squats. Uh, maybe some lunges where they hold dumbbells. Lunges. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Does it so. differ between? Now, I don't, want to, I don't want you to drift too much into your other athletes, right? But uh, between, like, uh, my curiosity would be, like, if you're going to get ready, get someone ready for a Highland Games or a, a Strongman event or something like that, uh, are they going to use dumbbells differently than your straight power lifters? Yeah, but maybe some. I mean, they, I'll, I'll have my athlete athletes do a lot more unilateral, uni, yeah, unilaterally loaded stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they might. Um, but for them, I mean... Highland Games specifically, there's a lot more speed work and things like that because it's not that far away from a pure strength sport. It's just more explosive. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, my baseball players and football players, yeah, they probably use a lot more, a lot more dumbbells because we don't. I don't have them go for heavy, heavy, heavy weights as much. There's, that's not their job. Their job isn't to max their squat. Their job is to be better at football and right. baseball. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so we'll probably use a little more of that. I mean, I'd say the most, the two most common exercises that we use dumbbells for, well, three most. We do a lot of single armed rows. Um, there's a greater range of motion you can get, I think, than you can with a barbell. Yep. Um, and usually people mess it up less. Uh, so rowing, overhead work, and some dumbbell bench. Uh, I think I like the shoulder stability of a dumbbell bench compared to a barbell. It's funny how many people. I can bring in. They've done nothing but barbell bench, and you give them dumbbells. They're like, "Oh, this is this is tough." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I think the shoulder health and stability of, of dumbbell benching for general athletes and then powerlifters in the off season is a great one. Why? Well, if you're not doing it, they really should. I'm encouraged to hear you say that because I loved dumbbell benching. You know, like it's for me, it's always it's been the reverse because barbell benching it, it grinds my shoulders no matter how I do it. You know, I don't want to grab too wide or too narrow, whatever it is. But I'll still, I mean, I'm an old man, but I'll still grab 80s or 100s and just do a few kinds of things with dumbbells. 
And, you know, because you can supinate and, and, you know, the different kinds of rotation and stuff, I can take the grinding part out of it, at least for me, the way I'm built, you know, but. No, I think, uh, I think it's a lot more healthy on your shoulders. You're not in, you're not stuck in that extremely internally rotated position that you are when you're stuck to a barbell. Right, right you're on. You're able to more, you know. Yep. So. Okay. We're drifting into Dr. Nelson territory, I think, here. So let's ask you, um. <laughs> I, I almost hesitate to ask you, like, how how do you use them with clients, right? Uh, do you like them? Do you use them much? And if so, how? Yeah, I <clears throat> I use them some for myself, uh, <clears throat> a fair amount for clients, just because, you know, most of my clients are working in a kind of average commercial type, you know, gym. So it's something that almost all gyms have access to, which is nice. Um, probably my top three movements are almost the same as what Phil said. Like my clients probably get a little tired of some type of dumbbell bench and dumbbell row combination um, <clears throat> because you can change the the bench. You can make it an angle. You can do one arm at a time. You can do one arm goes up as the other arm goes down. You can have your palms kind of face each other, so more of a, a neutral. Your arms are more at your side for benching, some more tricep type stuff. Um, and because a lot of the stuff I do is online, <clears throat> I'm not there watching them all the time. And I've seen over the years what people do with just a straight bar flat bench press, which can be an awesome exercise. But yeah, if you're not there watching it or you're not coaching it, it can sometimes turn into a disaster. So I really like dumbbells for that. I think what Phil said is is, is great. The one-arm dumbbell row, I, that's probably one of my favorites in terms of a staple exercise because pretty much everyone can work on more rowing myself included and i like doing them from a split stance so put one arm on the end of a bench and then put both feet on the floor and split your stance i just find that having the one knee up on the bench just to, seems to be more unstable i think especially as people get into heavier loads mm -hmm. especially if they're an athlete you want them to transfer that load into the ground to begin with um, yeah, and so another one I like too is, um, I agree with Phil said that if I have people do seated stuff, I almost always have them take away the back support because I want them to stabilize their core and that type of thing too. I just find that if people have a back support, it turns into more of an incline press than really a, a free seated press. And then another one, if I'm trying to change the activation even more, I'll have them sit uh, flat on the floor so each leg out at like 45 degrees and then press only with one side with a kettlebell or a dumbbell so that way if i think when they're standing they're just really doing leaning into it with their low back if i have them sit with a kind of a flat seated position then you can't lean back anymore because you'll just fall over um so yeah and then you can get into more esoteric type stuff and change grips and use fat grips and fat grips extremes and one arm stuff and all sorts of crazy things. Right. I, I am stricken by how identical, not just similar, our preferences are. All three of us from yeah. different perspectives because I still have a, I would call it like an anatomical bodybuilder type bias, right? So mm -hmm. it's less, a little less functional, a little more toward aesthetics, I guess, but um one arm dumbbell rows i love them oh god oh, Not yeah. for the range That's of motion exercise yeah um like if you want to work on your lower lats you could pull it more into your hip you know you can mm -hmm. you can alter it and bring it up you know a little more superior and keep and work your like more your traps upper back kinds of stuff the, yeah the range of motion um the overhead pressing like phil i don't like to sit and do i just don't think it's anatomically very healthy but and i i like the challenge of just grabbing a couple of reasonably heavy dumbbells and stand in the middle of the floor and overhead press them you know one mm -hmm. one arm both arms you know unilateral or whatever um, i love it um oh the other thing i might add is and again this is you're not you might not see this quite as much in in other uh biases or other sports but i love pr what i call profanity curls if you place a muscle in a stretch position, you work it almost entirely in a stretch position, you can cause so much eccentric soreness and hopefully growth from that. So I, I'd put a uh, utility bench or an incline type bench. I'd set it at a pretty steep incline and lean back. And then you can imagine the humerus of your upper arm, then it kind of fades toward the back. 
and then I would do negatives. So I would curl it up with a, a sort of a lightish weight, like a 40 pound dumbbell, something like that, curl it up and then do four count negatives. And you know, you, you do those, and I call them profanity curls because by the time you get to four or five reps, you're like, oh shit, shit, oh fuck, you know? <laughs> and it's, it's just, it, it's very, um, it kind of creates a burning sensation and it just, uh, but man, if you have stubborn biceps, um, profanity curls, right? So eccentric curls in a slightly uh, reclined position. Wow. So, yeah. I, and I just love the ability to supinate, you know, different parts of your forearm, your brachialis, brachioradialis, a little more biceps itself. And you could just really kind of fine tune what you're doing, you know, when you think about them. So. Yeah, and I love that exercise too with some clients because the the long head of the bicep crosses up into the shoulder. Yes. And most people, if they're sitting at their desk, myself included, the it's the arm just doesn't travel much behind the body, which is why I think rows are so beneficial for a lot of people. So something like that, where you're using a lighter-ish load, but you're purposely driving that that humerus all the way back, and you're stretching that long head of the bicep. I think is a a good exercise because obviously you're having it work under load in that kind of position behind the body, which it doesn't go that often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good perspective. Okay, uh, Phil, next, do you ever see dumbbells misused or used in a way that you're like, that's just a waste of time? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I see everything misused. <laughs> uh, uh, God. Um, Trying to think of something specific. Um, I think, yeah, I, I don't understand like going for anything super low rep with a dumbbell. Mm -hmm. I just, it's just, you're asking for something bad to happen due to <laughs> the less stability of the item, especially like a dumbbell bench. You know, there's more of a case of the, you just drop it on your face than there is. Uh, mm. I mean, I think it's more of a, at least five plus rep type move. Uh, Due to safety, I mean, you are loading a lot more smaller, tiny little muscle groups that are probably a lot easier, easily injured than you are with uh, yeah. something that's more stable stabilizers and, and assisters. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so okay. that'd no. probably be the the first one that jumps out the head. I and think then that's people good. throwing them and dropping them like from massive heights a lot, but uh, you know. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Why are you doing one rep maxes with dumbbells? Right. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't make any <laughs> sense to me. <laughs> um, at least not regularly. I, yeah, I, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Dr. Nelson? Because I, I know, again, I perceive you as someone who gets very creative. You use lots of, you know, unilateral or odd lifts and things like that. And can you use them wrong? If so, what do people do? Uh, um, yeah, like Phil said, you can use everything wrong at some point. But I think it goes back to what is your intention, right? So if you walk into the gym and you see a guy doing what you think is a back squat and you see him just getting folded over at the waist, you're like, oh my God, that's the worst looking back squat I've ever seen. And then you find out, oh, he's doing a good morning. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay then. <laughs> oh, right. Because of intent. Right. Yeah. Right. So his intent was to do that on, on purpose. Um, so again, I think it depends on what are you trying to do. I mean, I agree with Phil that I don't think there's much use for dumbbells for you know singles and doubles and triples and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's maybe a few exceptions there, and more advanced athletes, if you know, like in strongman, if you're doing a a heavy you know overhead one arm press. But even then, when I do that with with clients, it's going to be more rep work to start, obviously. And I'm purposely going to put like a uh, fat grip or increase the diameter of the grip on purpose because I know that that's going to be kind of their their limiter then. And that's going to limit kind of how much they're able to use. So I will kind of purposely put that on there so that they can't go too crazy. Um, but yeah, I don't I do wonder sometimes about Olympic -y type lifting with dumbbells, although I have done you know, dumbbell snatches and stuff like that in the past. I don't know, they just never feel that good to me. And I'm, I'm not a Olympic lifter by any stretch of the imagination, but I have kettlebells and I find kettlebells work much better for that. I mean, I can do higher rep snatches with kettlebells and it's fine, but I don't know. Dumbbells feels just, I don't know, just seems to be a, a little weird, but yeah, I've done it. And then 
one other thing that I, I do like that I think may be done kind of incorrectly a lot of times is when you guys were talking about dumbbell rows, I'll have people literally go almost all the way to the end of the shoulder range of motion. And obviously you have to start progressively with this, but please allow your scapula to rotate all the way out so that you're almost in that fully stretched position at the, the bottom and then come back. I just think from you know movement and injury reduction possibly over time that that's going to be much better. Um, but if people haven't allowed that for a while, then they have to start very, very light. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, it was more with a farmer carry than a one-arm row, but um, I hadn't been doing it much, and I really went for that fully rotated, stretched out position, and oh, yeah. I don't know, it was my rhomboid or something, I'm like, okay, that wasn't that wasn't smart, you know, I should have built Yeah, that especially if bit. you're not used to it, it's, because it's amazing, like, I've had some people here where I'm like, okay, let your arm go all the way at the bottom, and even with a light load, it's just, ooh, yeah. But I'm like, but if you're going to hang from a bar, right? I mean, you, that's going to be your your strongest position. But it's again, right? It's your body's going to build up tissue wherever you've used it. So right on. Mm. All right. Um, last one. Uh, let me set the stage with this. I'll actually go first to set the stage because we're talking about what's good and bad with dumbbells. But least favorite use now. One of the things, and this doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. You just don't like them. Like there's two things with dumbbells I just really haven't done. Uh, I did. They don't. I don't. They don't feel very good for me. Like one of them is lunges, and some people might be like, "Oh, Lowry, you should do some, you know, heavy dumbbell lunges." I, I just don't. I don't know why. I just never really have. Maybe that's to my detriment. I don't know. Um, the other is something that you asked me to do, Mike, years ago when I tore my <laughs> triceps, which was one arm, just lying triceps extensions, right? Instead of with my easy curl bar, right? Because I tore oh, my yeah, triceps. Yeah. I'm not going to start loading that heavily. And I just felt, you know, that's, that's good advice. I need to start working, like you say, on some of those supporting tissues and other things and do this very light and put myself in a sort of a novel, almost a rehabby kind of thing. But I yeah, ha yeah. I don't care for those for those what <laughs> dumbbell lying triceps extensions and they just make they weird me out. So is there something that you guys whether regardless of the value of the movement you don't care for with dumbbells? What about you, Phil? Mm, um I I I don't care for dumbbell curls. I don't know why. Huh. I'd rather just grab a barbell. Mm -hmm. And that's probably Interesting. I don't care much so i want to get them done as quick as i can and i can do both at once if i use a barbell <laughs> <laughs> that's a power lifter talking right there yeah <laughs> okay i'll go with that what about you mike um kind of like what i said i did not a big fan of like kind of the the snatch and the kind of the dumbbell hammer curls to a press and i think they can be okay but they just it, to me, they've never felt very good, and I've not put a lot of time and effort into them. If I'm going to do that, I've got enough kettlebells. I'll do that with kettlebells, and that seems to feel a lot better. Um, a little bit similar to you, like if I have a preference, and again, it's not always an option, I'll have someone do a lunge, <clears throat> and then I'll have them hold like a dumbbell overhead at extension. If I had a choice, I'd rather use a kettlebell because I kind of want that weight behind them kind of pulling their arm back, so to speak, and it just seems to feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, like you were saying with the, the dumbbell isolation stuff, I'm almost the inverse. Like for me to use an easy curl bar for like a old school skull crusher or something, it feels like my elbows are going to pop off me. Mm -hmm. um, but oddly enough, if I use dumbbells and especially if I go to a decline, that seems to keep you know the humerus a little bit more up and down, and that doesn't seem to bother me at all. So yeah. I think a lot of it is just people working around, you know, what feels good, you know, for them, and kind of just tweaking the positions a little bit. I remember yeah. Bill Bill Pearl. He told us on the show, I think, or it might have been before we were recording, but he said, "Oh, kettlebells, you know." People act like that's a new thing. We <laughs> we use dumbbells now because they're better than kettlebells. Yeah. Kettlebells were the original. <laughs> But, but the, um, yeah, anything that's going to be like rotational like that or like, you know, that sort of swinging kind of motion like you're talking about is like some yeah. of the more olympic -y type things. D kettlebells do make more sense, right? They just do. So. Dumbbell swings, I've never understood that at all. <laughs> I don't care how you do them. It just feels dumb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
All right. Well, that's. I think that's good. I think we kind of covered it. A lot of dumbbell stuff. Listeners, if you have any questions, I guess uh, you know. Do you do something with specifically with dumbbells that you know you'd like us to discuss? Yeah, ask up in the forum. Yeah, forum yeah. or just ask us. Yeah, send an email, whatever it might be. All right. Good stuff. Uh, I'll catch cool. up with you guys next week. I guess. Yep. Cool. Catch you later. See ya. Hey listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store. One for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry. And they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store. Uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, The stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, Please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org store. Uh, We also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.